All right. Well, Julie and I are thrilled to welcome Yael Trush onto our into onto our program today. She is a money mindset and management coach, and I cannot tell you how excited it is because nothing really like I feel like all those things together are just like everything what everyone needs. I think actually. so too. So that's very exciting. <laughs> I wanted just to kick off very quickly. How did you become? How does one become? Or how did you become a money mindset and management coach? Probably sounds like there's an interesting uh, personal story there. Oh my gosh. Is there one? Yes, absolutely. Like you guys probably know, like we're teaching what we've experienced and what we've learned. Right. Um, so I'll tell you, I, despite having had a career in finance and having an MBA and all the things at some point in my life, actually, I should say during the last recession back in 2008, I was already married and I realized that my relationship with money wasn't all that great. Um, it was more one of it'll get taken care of. Um, my husband has it handled. I don't have to worry. And then all of a sudden I realized, well, one second, like this is a partnership. This is something that I'm supposed to have some understanding about. And yet when it comes to my own money, um, I really don't, even though I worked in finance, I had studied all this. And that took me on a journey to explore the world of personal finance and money. And what I came to realize, surprisingly enough, was that a lot of what really changed my mindset and my habits around money had more to do with the wisdom of my faith, of my Jewish faith, than all the practical that was easy or, or the technical stuff. That was the easy part. That's ironic. That was the easy part. The harder part was applying things that had that I were at the core of who I am, but perhaps for mo most of my adult life, I had given lip service to. I'm curious, did you find that the way that you grew up or kind of the environment in your home, like what created that mindset in the first place? I'm just really interested to hear more about what created that sense. Like you didn't really want to know you wanted to take a back seat. You wanted to let your husband kind of manage it and you would make money, but to, to the overall, you know, financial, you know, health of the home, how, how did that come about? Yeah. I, I, I so appreciate this question because I've thought about it often. It's very interesting. I grew up um, being raised to be super ambitious, super go-getter, and yet there was this, and my friends and I often joke about this is not just me. There was this underlying assumption that Prince Charming was going to take care of it. So I was a person who would, even though I worked in Wall Street and I worked 50 hour, 60 hour work weeks, uh -huh. my personal finance stuff was just a disaster. A disaster in the sense that I didn't pay the the attention that it deserved, right? Um, and that's not healthy. Like I always tell my students, like money is such an important resource. We have to give it positive attention, in spite most of us go through life giving it a lot of negative attention and a lot of negative energy, right? So I think there was that push and pull where, yes, um, you know, I definitely had a privileged life relative to other people. Um, but on the one hand, there were times in my parents' relationship where there was lack of clarity about what was going on and then things weren't as comfortable. There was really no um, intentional education and conversations or healthy modeling of conversations. But there was this underlying assumption that, oh, you could take care of yourself. You'll make the money. Oh, but don't be so smart or don't be so accomplished that you don't get married because, you know, you have to get Prince Charming and he has to have a certain status. So it was like this contradictory messages that so many of us grew up with. That's I mean, that's so interesting. And what was what was that shift that had to take place for you that felt like okay, this, this really isn't working for me. This, this is starting to feel negative and it's starting to feel like I'm making the money, but what are my money decisions and, and, and how is that affecting my whole family? So I'll tell you, it really came from a place of my priority in life being my marriage. And so I remember having a conversation with someone and someone told me, well, you know, money's the number one cause of divorce or a financial struggles and couple between couples. And that hit me so hard. It sounds so silly, but I immediately said, I didn't do everything that I do to get into this beautiful, wonderful relationship. 
to become that statistic. There is no way I'm becoming that statistic. And it could be because my parents had been divorced and thankfully my mother remarried and everybody, everything was fine. But I immediately went to that place where this is not me. I'm not one of these people. And so if money is something that's going to affect my marriage, and I was seeing how it was causing tensions in an otherwise really beautiful, wonderful relationship, I was like, uh, yeah, oh, the box stops with you. Like, what are you going to do about this? Like, what's going to happen? Yeah, no, it's so interesting what you're saying, because um, most of the time when we think like money management issues, you think about it some, because a lot of people we work with, they don't have enough money. They want to supplement their income. So there is definitely that side where there's just like, not, I always talk about it. There's not enough. uh, What is it? Month month at the end of your money. So it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there's not enough. But on the other hand, on the other side of the coin, there's definitely that piece of like, we have money, but we are not really allocating it with intention. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so interesting that that can even cause kind of that marital conflict and kind of uh, disagreements and strife in marriage. It's it's well, I think I just, I think that, I think that working on what money means to you, like anything else, like with health, you know, there's certain people with with that, that health and exercises or, or entrepreneurship or religion is you know, sort of like one of those things that is so basic that we're not going to have a conversation. And they oftentimes don't wait, they don't figure out until down the road in the marriage, like, wait a minute, like we have completely different perspectives on that. So maybe what are some of those, you know, let's even move away from the marriage thing, because from my perspective, like even before you figure out what you say to your spouse, how do you figure out what money means to you? Wow, that's such a good question. Well, I always like to go back to something that Julie, you tried to do earlier with me. It's go back to those early money paradigms, right? Like what was going on in your home of origin? What did you hear? What did what did you see? What were those experiences? What are, what are, what is your earliest money memory? That's something really cool to kind of dive into. And you start seeing that there's certain beliefs that you have about money, like if you get really, really honest, and obviously this is best done sitting down with a coach, um, you start seeing that you have certain beliefs about money that then you've behaved according to that script, not knowing that, not, not, not just because we do things on autopilot, right? And so when we start uncovering that, we say, oh, maybe there's stuff here that I want to edit out. Like I always like to call this part of the process editor, right? One second. That is such a bomb. I want to go back and just repeat what I heard you say, make sure that that's actually true, which is that so many people have a tendency to look at money as that, which is, and what I'm sure, and and maybe just give like, if, if there's even a, tangible story. Like so many of us look at money as like with shame or like, I don't have it, or I don't know how to make it. So do you have an an example either in your own life or with a client of yours where they were completely, like they weren't even aware of Mm -hmm. how their money story was affecting the decisions they made, the jobs they took potentially, or how they spent or invested their money? Sure. Absolutely. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you my own personal one. Cause I think that's, um, you know, it's, uh, more vivid for my, for me. I had my earliest money memory. I was about six or seven years old. I had been sent to Florida to visit my grandmother, um, who was th- visiting my aunt and my grandmother and I went to this big American mall. I came from a small Island of Puerto Rico. There was no such thing when I was growing up. And she took me to, let's say, just this fancy department store. And there was this guest outfit. And I would, you know, remember guests with the logo and whatever, right? And she said, you could try those two outfits on. And I tried them on. And she said, you like them? And I said, yeah. Can I have them? She said, sure. And she, and then she said, um, will your mother pay for them? And I was seven. Like, I don't even know what that means. You just told me I could have them. Like my mother, she bought the outfits. Next thing I know, I'm in Puerto Rico and I'm in the midst of an argument between mother and daughter about how could you not pay if you're the grandmother and how could you not pay if you're the mother? So can you imagine the impression a seven-year-old has and the decisions she made about money right then and there? On the one hand, money means love. If they love me, they would buy it for me. On the other hand, I must not be very lovable, right? These are two of my most loving figures and they're having this argument, right? 
I'm seven. I have no idea what their history, their financial history, what, what this, the context of this, like most children, they, we have no idea, but we make certain decisions. So throughout my life, I overspend, I overextended myself, even though I could make money, right? Because I wasn't worthy. And by the way, I need to have many things because if I have those things, it means self-love. And by the way, if I'm in a relationship and Hugh and my husband here, if he has to say no, if something can't happen right now, he doesn't love me. So you see how these things play out like, and you have to work through them yourself to understand. And if you're in a relationship, you have to build a communication, which is the hardest part where you understand each other. And then you can have that empathy. And then you can have these conversations a few years down the line where you triggered by something and your husband can smile at you and say, it's okay. I'm not your father or whatever it is. And you can smile and you can understand. But before it would have been a full blown explosion. It's so interesting. One of the things that I was going to ask, I was going to ask Julie also, because, you know, we, we came from sort of like middle, like my family came from like middle class, but like Julie's an immigrant, an immigrant family came here with no money. And then was, was like raised in uh, amongst like in Calabasas, which is, I'm not sure the equivalent in Texas, but you know, the, uh, the play, yeah, she went to like, you went to school, like Will Smith's like kid or something like that. So like, what was very, very affluent. affluent. Like, what was that? How did you I guess I'd love to hear sort of like how your money script developed. And then yeah, Elle, I don't know if there's any thoughts or like kind of questions that you could put out there for someone that does see all these different kinds of extremes that, um, that, that I guess at least Julie or Julie, Julie experienced. I think that like, you know, we all kind of have these um, conflicting messages that come at us because we really are so um, multi-layered people yeah. and, you know, it was interesting for me because we didn't really have money, but then I went to school with a ton of kids who had tons and tons of money mm -hmm. and were super affluent. So for me, I was always, you know, saving when we were hanging out at friends' house. Most of the time I was hanging out at their houses and not my house because their houses are much nicer than mine. Um, no, and it wasn't a very conscious, I don't think it was like this conscious thing. It just it was more comfortable at their house. So we won't always went there. And I lived a little bit further out, not in the nicer parts of the, you know, town or whatever. So, um, you know, it was just, I don't know, it was just a fascinating environment to, in myself, I knew how to control. Like if we went out for dinner or we went out to the mall, like I didn't buy anything. I would, or I would just, I would be very cognizant of what I ordered, let's say mm. if we were going out. And my friends were really re not, didn't really have to do that. And so I definitely brought that, I think with me into adulthood, like it, it, it went in a direction that, you know, and then we also didn't have money <laughs> for a lot of our marriage. So it was like, I was always just feeling this sense of control. And now that we have money and I'm like allowing to like loosen the reins a little bit, there is a little bit of that fear in me. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to just go nuts because now we have it. And now I can. And, but there is a balance, like it's okay. Like allow, like, mm -hmm. so I'm curious to hear from you. Like when you coach can I just share, cause I think this will actually be super interesting for anyone that we end up working with that works as a couple. So I had the exact opposite situation, which was, I didn't even know, like I grew up like on the floor of Nordstrom when my mm -hmm. mom was shopping. And, um, so I never knew that there was anything like the whole thing, like with you, like holding back, that was never my experience. I was always overspending. I, I like, it's terrible to buy gifts for me. Cause I already bought the nice thing that you were thinking about maybe buying for me. And so I guess maybe, I, you know, it's very hard for yeah, to shop right? this guy. So, so, <laughs> uh, so it's just like, so I think that that's a really interesting thing. Like even using us as an example of how the different backgrounds of Julie having to be more ca cautious, but being having access to more affluence, me who was sort of like never really checking like how much stuff cost and sort of being in a kind of uh, homogeneous area financially. How do you look at either the individual or the couple in terms of like working on creating a story around money that actually supports where they want to go and, and who they are as individuals. Yeah. So great oh question. God, we gave you a lot. We're making so. you work now. We're making <laughs> yeah, you work. Yeah. You're putting me to work. But first of all, it's very funny because I, I could relate totally to Julie's story, by the way, I also was the one who didn't have as much as my, you know, I grew up, yeah. I didn't have the same reaction as you, Julie. I didn't have the savings muscle exercise. So I was a little bit like your husband in that sense. So I think to your question about where I would take this. So now that there's an open and an understanding, then it's time to say, okay, but what do we want? What do we want to create, right? I, I, re 
realized that my parents didn't save or my parents didn't invest, or I realized like, what is the family that we want to build? And we ask ourselves questions now as a couple, knowing where we come from and we start then designing the, the system based on the new goals and the new stories that we create. But I would actually, I need to add to that a really important component, which is as a couple, and and this we do as individuals too, is we know our story and then we get really clear on what are our values. Because what tends to happen is we just go through the motions, either one overspends and the other doesn't, doesn't spend a penny or whatever those motions are without understanding what are the values that are of the essence to my life and that I want my time and my money to support. And so when we take pen to paper as a couple and we say, well, these are the things that are so important to me. And these are the things that are so important to you. And there's so much, there's commonality here and there maybe isn't. And that's okay because we have to bridge that gap because we love each other. Right. And so where is our money going? And so if we see that we're spending a lot of money at Nordstrom's, but we keep saying that Jewish continuity, for example, is super important and we can't ever make tuition or we can't ever send our kids to the camps that we want. Well, maybe there's something to reassess there. Right. And we have to have these honest, tough conversations and then continue have these money dates, I like to call them, where we n- we're not just looking at the numbers just for the mechanics of it, but we're really always going back to the values. What is this aligned with my values? And if I would invest or spend in this, um, is, is it going to compromise my ability to finance something that is of the essence to this family? These are the conversations that we're continuously having. I wanted to selfishly ask for our audience because I think that we we have kind of a unique group that we speak to in in our in our coursework of people. Again, for, for right now, we have a lot of people that do come from a let's call it a God based background where there's an idea of a kind of the infinite uh, you know provider. Yes. And so one of the things that I see a lot of times that people almost again like wh- one of the things that I loved about what you said just in my work of like working with entrepreneurs then working with people that want to be entrepreneurs and saying like, you know, a business owner doesn't look at money or ideally doesn't look at money from a shame component or value. It's like, do I have the capital or not? How do I find it? And so you just very clearly like laid out practically speaking, well, what do we want? And then it's like, but, but one of the things that I think for a lot of our, our clientele that's, that's very difficult is first of all, like giving yourselves permission to actually have a want. Like, I can't tell you how many people look at, I I love cars. I've always loved cars. The secret is I didn't pick a bright yellow sports car. I would have been fine with a black sports car, something a little bit more understated. Now you know when I'm coming, right? But but the idea is like a lot of people look at that like, well, I'm not superficial, but there's a lot of people that really want. Maybe it's the again, I don't care about belts because I wear like athleisure clothes all the time. So, but some people maybe want the want the what's the the Ferragamo belt or the Gucci shoes, right? Which for me is like just signs of uh, uh, slavery and oppression uh, because you know like why <laughs> why, why wear Gucci shoes and you can wear sandals? Uh, but anyway, but the idea. Is is basically that you know how does a, how do you help a person that might have come from a world of lack accept their desires accept their wants and also in a in a god based system like how do you almost a lot of people are like well it wasn't meant for me when in reality one of the things that we're constantly pushing is like maybe god wants you to have it and you just have to do something different in order to have that as opposed to kind of be this like flailing victim of the universe well first of all Thank you for the question. Just nailed the, the nail it on the head because the name of my program is actually called God Wants You to Be Rich. So let's just yeah, start. There you right. go. There you go. <laughs> Teed it up, but I didn't even know. Perfect. And just let, just just understand this, okay? And I think um, I, I appreciate the question because so many entrepreneurs struggle with this shame around money, like you said. And let's just understand first of all that money is not negative or positive. It is a neutral tool that is given to us by the infinite creator, whatever you want to call it. I call it God, right? So that we can be of impact and service in this world. So how do we get past any shame about our relationship with the material? We get super clear on the why. Why do I want this money? What what does it advance? What does it help me do? Right? Like there's so much um the, we are both physical and spiritual. So there it's, it's like, we don't have to feel like there is a tension between both. We actually have to feel, um, 
that we want to be integrating them constantly. So what is that car going to help me do? How many more good deeds or better clients I'm going to get or better investors? Like, how does it advance my mission? So it goes back again. We have to get super clear on what my values are and what is my mission. And that is really, I'm sure you do work with uh, your clients on this. That's really individual, but there is a global mission for every human me being to be here of service. If I'm given another day in this world today, it's because I have something to contribute. Now, every, each and every one of us has certain talents, capabilities, experiences, challenges that make the makeup of who we are and how we can serve, right? And so we serve in that way. And then in return, because of a value we've provided, we get money. And that money continues to help us advance that mission. So no shame in the money get super clear on the why. Why am I here? And why is this money going to advance my mission is going to keep supporting me, right? So if I want the big house, is the big house just to feed my ego? Or is the big house because hosting and having people in my home is one of my core values? It's really something that I want to shine at as a as, as, shine at as a family, then by all means, go for the big house run a successful business that can afford you the big house, right? So these are the types of conversations that we have to have with ourselves and we have to have with our spouse. And when we're running our business, we have to get really clear that there is no shame in a monetary return in exchange because it, it actually means that you're delivering something that the world values and that requires an exchange. I love it. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna say that that last piece for all of us. I, again, I, I work with a, we 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 both work with a lot of like therapists and rabbis and and Rebbitsons and and you know call them, you know spiritual practitioners. And that piece that you just said also is so crucial, which is that the amount that you put out. Again, I always say like everyone's like I can't tell you how many people come to me and they're like, oh my gosh, I am the greatest. I, you know, and I'm like, well, what do you want to coach around? They're like, oh, I coach how to have a meaningful life to live with impact. And I'm like, has anyone ever actually paid you to do that? And they're like, no, but I do it a lot for free. And I was like, not terribly valuable. So I think that other piece of the, uh, and one of the things that we love talking about is like humility and ego is, that's right. If you find yourself like so many people just on the, you know, again, like Julie says, like with too much month at the end of your money, maybe it might be an indication that what you're doing isn't terribly valuable or you haven't dropped totally into your path, your power, where you actually can learn how to monetize it. God knows like we spent so long before I always thought like I was going to somehow find riches as a rabbi. And then I was like, wait a minute, none of these guys actually have money. And the thing that attracted me most about Judaism was seeing these businessmen that were able to balance family and life and, and, and have all, and, and that was really honestly through meeting the benefactors of my uh, outreach organization. Right. That was the first time I ever met entrepreneurs. That was the first time I actually saw like, I didn't grow up like Julie. Like I grew up very middle-class. I never actually saw rich people. And I'm like, wow, you can be rich and you can be married. And the means that you can do this is through Judaism. But then the somehow I became a rabbi on the other side. It's just, it's so interesting how until you're really like, again, with a magnifying glass over your experiences, you don't know where you got lost. And I, you know, and that's, that's just such a fascinating, um, I guess, experience. I yeah. Know. And I, and I think again, our creator is pushing us towards that. So people get so frustrated, right. But this is the challenge. It's like, delve deeper, like, where are you needed? And, and I could tell you my own journey, professional journey, as you know, we didn't get into this. But remember, I told you earlier that I just rebranded my podcast to Jewish Money Matters after almost five years. I mean, I started a podcast when nobody in the Jewish space was had a podcast. And it was based off of a blog that I'd had for four years. It was a creative outlet that I had as I was raising my family. And my we started our own business, my husband and I, but then I stepped away from the business to raise the kids for a while. And I had this blog called Jewish Latin Princess. And then eventually I said, well, I'm going to start a podcast. And basically in a nutshell, I used to weave spiritual insights into everything that had to do with our mundane material lives. Right. And as I, I had a lot of speaking engagements and all the things. And one day I sat and I said, what is the pain point that I'm solving? And I realized I wasn't making the money that I wanted to be making with my work because I wasn't solving one particular pain point. And I said, well, there's four pain points I see women struggling with. There's their relationship with their kids, their parenting. There's their relationship with their husbands, their marriage or their intimate life. And there's their relationship with their food or their body. And there's their relationship with money. And I said, well, I'm a pretty good mother, but I don't really want to talk about parenting the whole day. I have a good marriage. I have, I have a lot to say about that, but like, is this my thing? I have nothing to say about food. 
I have a lot to say about money. Not only that, I had my own financial journey. I also studied this stuff. And how come I don't tell everybody how Judaism impacted my relationship with money and changed everything in my marriage? And all of a sudden, I started opening my mouth and getting on stage and speaking about it and writing blog posts about it. And it was literally like I'd hit a raw nerve and people wanted more. And then I started serving more and more and more. And everything started from there. But it's like God had been pushing me the whole time, right? Like you think like, ah, but it's like, it's not about you. It's about the world. Like, why do you think I gave you this challenge? Why do you think I gave you this insight and this discovery into your life? Give it over, help others with it. I, what you're saying is so incredible because you sound literally like exactly the people we just start working with, you know, five, 10 years ago, which is we're, we're trying to encourage people to say, what is important to you? Where does your passion and expertise lie? And where can you translate that into an impact for someone else? And I think it's beautiful that you can crack the code for yourself, but now that you can actually impact, you know, hundreds and thousands of people through the work that you're doing, that's where we're saying, you know what, that's where the money lies, because it's through that impact and through that influence that you can actually, you know, create that, create the abundance as you're mm -hmm. affecting more people. So mm -hmm. It's really amazing. And I'll just say, just for the, for the teacher, what was, that, that you brought out also is like, one of the things we always talk about is, is that, you know, to build a very like successful business, you really don't need millions and millions of customers. You need a very loyal few of them. And so you're so like dialed in and niched in. It's like of all the people in the world that are all the people you're like talking to women and of all the women in the world, you're talking to Jewish women and your background is about finance, which is one fourth of the problems that, that Jewish women encounter. And of that, there's a component of your own Latin heritage that you're, that you're, that you're speaking to where naturally I'm, I'm sure there are certain cultural nuances that you get of the Latin Jewish community that, you know, other people might, someone like me would just miss. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that, that you've been able to dial it in, and then you also go and listen to the market and you find that the market's actually interested in hearing you. That's ultimately how you can build something that again, and maybe you'll just speak out the, the, the feeling of that process. It's like, not only do you get paid, but I have a feeling you actually love what you do and it doesn't exactly, drag you to work. every day. Exactly. 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 And by the way, the listening happens continuously. So for entrepreneurs, sometimes we get so hung up on like, I got to figure out the how, and it's like, leave the how to God. Just have a very clear why. Why are you serving in this way? And then what's the what in front of me in this playing field called life in the world that I have around me, right? What is my client saying? What is my audience saying? And so sometimes you you will, not sometimes, you will always be pivoting, pivoting in your business. If you're not, then you're not doing enough listening. <laughs> that's the thing. And that's also, it's such a fascinating idea that we find with so many people. They're like, I have to find my thing. I have to build my website. I have to get my social media oh. done. And I'm like, you idiot. I don't say that. I say nicely. But I say like, you have no idea of the five things you might want to do, which one actually is going to go. So exactly. like, don't do any of that. So the fact that you would say that is so crucial, like be open to pivoting. And if you're able to do it and you have that flexibility, you don't need to like hide behind your ego of like, I am the, again, like you said, the, the the Jewish Latin princess I get like that's like we, we didn't even like get into that but like the amount of humility it takes to like drop the brand that you've developed so that you can find the thing that authentically actually serves your audience like that's amazing and just having that expectation not being afraid of it says so much because so many people are like oh my god well I already started with this or oh I'm gonna, all my fans are gonna be like well I thought she was a Jewish Latin princess who is she talking about money you know right. what I mean so it's like that's really fascinating to be able to to do that now to expect that and, and I think this is this is where the magic happens, right? We got to get rid of the ego, right? The ego is going to tell me again, no, I have to stay with this path and I have to do it this way. And I and what are they going to think? And what are my high school friends going to think? I went like, well, it's not about you. Business is about another person. It's about what does God want from you for these people? What the, God's world needs you. So it's like I, I constantly go to that principle, right? That very Jewish principle of I'm here to serve. It's not about me. It's about them. What do they need? Um, and then it makes business a lot more enjoyable. And by the way, a lot more profitable. <laughs> right. I, I'm just curious. And it sounds like you've kind of touched on it already, but just the, the ability to actually do that of taking yourself out of the equation and asking what do other people need? Is that also kind of how people should approach this like money conversation of just taking a step back and 
again, you said money is neutral. So how do how are people able to like disentangle themselves a little bit, you know, when they're just starting out on the journey? What would be like that first piece of advice or kind of, you know, what would you leave people with? Like how if I this is interesting, how do I start? What what would you say to them? Well, if, if, if you're alluding to the fact that maybe they might be having trouble charging, is that what you're saying at the no, beginning? Not even necessarily charging, but if somebody has like a negative relationship to money and they're, they've just listened to you and they're like, wow, this is really interesting. Maybe, maybe I can make some shifts or maybe I want to, how do you take that fear out of it? And how, what would be like a first step to do doing so? Yeah. So I would take pen to paper and get really go through a why exercise, right? Like, why is this business important? Why? Why is it of the essence? And why do I want to be making money in this business? Why do a money, a business has to make money. Otherwise it's a hobby, right? So again, why is the money important? Can you, can you, re, can you repeat that? And can everyone listening write that down? Yes, please. <laughs> this is so important, by the way, a business, the, the two differences between a business and a hobby are a business makes money and a business is, ser- is about serving others. A hobby takes money, it costs you money, and it's about serving yourself. Awesome. Super important distinction. The minute you shift that, you're in business. So we got to start with the serving others, right? So it's not about serving you. Again, that's a hobby. That's very nice. Go do that in your spare time. It's lovely. It's important. That's a hobby. It's not a business. It costs you money. A business has to be making money. So back to, back to the question. So then I would then look at how am I operating my business and where, where, where is it really showing that I'm not really in, in, a, in a positive relationship with my money? Am I not charging? Am I not billing on time? Am I giving discounts when nobody's been asking me for a discount, <laughs> right? Am I offering everything for free? Am I not keeping my accounts in check? Like, do I actually have a business account or is it all a mess? Right. That all of that stuff, right, right there. Cause I always say, see the emotional part is super important. The editing part, like we talked about getting clear on our money story and our why and our purpose and our values. But then we have to do an investigation. This is in our business and our personal lives. We get to a stage of investigation where the numbers actually give us a ton of clarity. And so, so many of us are so scared to look at the numbers, actually looking at the numbers can be really empowering because then I see, oh, of course I haven't built all these clients. Oh, look, I must have a block here. How come I haven't built them? Right. Or how come I didn't follow up with them? Or how come I had that conversation with that client and right away I offered them a discount. So you've got to catch yourself and that awareness and brings you to change. Oh, I have to do something about this. Look, I'm not making enough money, but look at all these clients who haven't paid me. So it's my, it's the buck stops with me, right? It's not their fault. It's your fault. Right. It's amazing. I mean, I think that it's, it's very interesting because you think this is just all things external to you, but when you take a deeper look, it's like, yeah, there, what's the resistance behind not billing on time? What's the resistance behind not following up with the client or, or whatever it may be, or even just yourself and checking your, the, the Jacob used to have this, like never checking the bank account, like right? just hope for the best. It's hope for the okay. best. Right? And now you know? I tell my students, check your bank account before every transaction and check it until the day that you're going to be so excited to look at your bank account. And so we have to get used to getting, being so in touch with our numbers, right? Like what is the money coming in? What's the money coming out? Like the clarity it gives you people are, we're so scared of it. And I was, I was an avoider for most of my twenties. Right. Um, and now it's like, I want to know like what money went, where, where is it going? Like, it's just like, the again, it, it just the whole relationship is one of flow and ease, and it has nothing to do with whether there's a lot of money in the bank or not. That's where people don't understand. They think, well, that's easy if you have a lot of money. No, 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 no. It's the clarity. Get even if you don't have a lot of money right now, it's just the clarity that you are an, an understanding. You're 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 in an empowered position. You're telling your money where to go, what to do, right, and not feeling in the dark constantly. Amazing. Well, Yael, thank you so much for this. This was fantastic. A great start to the conversation. And how can people find you? Can you share with us a little bit about your new program and and where people can reach you? Yes, absolutely. So first easy way to find me is in the Jewish Money Matters podcast on iTunes or anywhere you listen. I also have a wonderful all women's Facebook, private Facebook group called Jewish Money Matters. And I have an upcoming program that is going to be five free days where I am going to bring you to 
to calm and confidence with your money. We're going to really dive into the money mindset and how to really get into a, the, the nuance of building a richer life. Um, and that we can register at jewishlatinprincess.com forward slash ready because it's called I am ready. I am ready to have a rich life. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. What an honor and pleasure. Loved it. Thank you. Mine, mine. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.